the, our last uh, talk for the Half-Baked series for uh, the fall 2020. And today I'm really happy that we have with us, with us uh, Alison Suen, who is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Iona College, uh, just upstate New York. And she received her PhD from uh, Vanderbilt University and her research interests are primarily in the areas of animal ethics and uh, feminist philosophy. So we thank her for being with us today. And uh, the title of her talk is Ethical Dining uh, in the Age of the Pandemic, uh, or actually Pandemic Eating, you know, in the shortened um, version. We will be recording the talk, uh, but not the Q&A. If uh, any of you has questions during the talk, you can also write them in chat uh, so that uh, she can collect them for, uh, for the discussion. Alison, thanks again for being here. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for being here today. And uh, I wanna say that I really enjoyed listening to the three papers earlier this semester and uh, I'm grateful uh, that you know you've invited me to give a paper as well, and I look forward to hearing your comments and, and questions after. Uh, so, as you know, today uh, I, I want to talk about pandemic and eating, um, pandemic and food, uh, and there are two objectives um, uh, for my presentation today. Uh, the first is to consider um, you know different ethical issues related to food that arise because of the pandemic. And the second um, is to think about how these issues might affect our identity as eaters. Um, so I apologize for the noise outside. <laughs> I hope it's not too distracting. So let me give you a little bit of a context here. Um, and that would also explain the noise because I live in, uh, I live in New York um, I live in a pretty crowded area in New York, um, in Little Italy, Chinatown area. Uh, and as you know, uh, New, York's, New York was a hot spot for coronavirus back in March and April. And we were under a pretty extensive lockdown. In fact, uh, the city um, has only started uh, to allow indoor dining uh, at a reduced capacity uh, at the end of September. And I think that they will stop indoor dining uh, uh, next next Monday because of the you know the rise in cases again. So uh, my, my talk is very much informed by my own observations and personal experience and some of the issues that uh, I discuss may be more culturally and geographically specific. And from the very beginning of the of the lockdown, I noticed that food featured prominently in my daily efforts, to adjust to the new reality. Well, first of all, I have to stock up on food and um, uh, for the lockdown and possible quarantine. And the supermarket turns out to be the site where I realized the gravity of the situation. So this is a picture that I took uh, when I was, um, when I went to Whole Foods, which is a popular chain, you know, supermarket uh, here. Uh, this is at the beginning of March. And you can see that, you know, the, the, in the canned food areas, uh, this is a pretty empty shelf. I've never seen anything like this. Um, and as you can see, even during the pandemic, uh, no one seemed to want to panic buy canned pumpkins. Um, so here's another picture of, uh, of empty shelves in the supermarket. Um, the pasta aisle is being cleared out. And, uh, and you might have heard of the toilet paper shortage. And it looks like this family um, scored a lot of uh, toilet paper at the end. So good for them. All right. Uh, so now I will say more about, um, uh, you know, a, a, a little bit more about this later on. For now, I just want to point out that um, not everyone sees the horror of the pandemic firsthand, especially if you are not working at a hospital. You may read the news, but it's not like you see bodies pile on the, uh, piling up on the street. So it is actually, you know, the empty shelves at the supermarket or the deserted streets that give people a really concrete sense of the impending doom. So there are three ways I want to look at how the pandemic intersects with food politics. The first, uh, the first two are both about, are both about justice 
Um, one has to do with um, equity when it comes to food distribution. And the other has to do with our ethical responsibility to those who provide this food. And then finally, I want to look at how the pandemic may change the way we see ourselves as eater. So uh, let's begin with the uh, issue of food insecurity and especially how the lockdown has disrupted um, access to food. So in the United States, um, 20.5 million uh, jobs were lost uh, in April 2020 alone. And over 40 million uh, workers filed for unemployment benefits between March and May 2020. Food banks saw an unprecedented increase of needs. And one food bank based in uh, Las Vegas was spending an extra 300 to 400,000 a week to buy foods. And another food bank in San Antonio has doubled the number of people it was feeding, right, from uh, 60,000 pre COVID to 120,000 in May um, uh, 2020. Okay. And this is a picture uh, you can see a picture of cars uh, lining up for food in San Antonio, Texas here. So this is one way, you know, the lack of employ employment has pushed a lot of people to have to line up uh, for, for food. Um, so that's one way, you know, uh, the, the pandemic exposed or, you know, introduced food insecurity. Another way the uh, pandemic has exposed um, issues of food insecurity is through closing school, uh, cl uh, school closure. Students in New York public school receive breakfast and lunches and many low-income families rely on um, these meals to feed their children. So there are no in, uh, when there are no in-person classes, what is at stake is not just the quality of the education; it is also uh, food. Um, it is also about food security. Now, uh, New York City actually continues to provide uh, meals for their students even with the school closing, right, shutting down. Students and families, they can go to school buildings to pick up their meals. But one of the problems with these grab and go meals is that they are usually cold and prepackaged. And so they are not particularly appetizing. Um, a lot of students ended up get, uh, you know, just skipping meals because they can eat you know, so much hummus, yogurts and sandwiches. Whereas uh, pre-pandemic students were fed fresh hot meals in the cafeteria um, now they are left with a much more limited menu. So it seems that the, in, uh, the, the pandemic uh, not just exposes existing food insecurity, it also introduces new problems. Um, so the first point that I, oops. the first point that I, uh, on food insecurity that I want to draw attention to is related to restaurant closure and specifically the ban on indoor dining. Um, now, obviously the, the livelihood of those in the industry, you know, uh, is at stake. And I'll say more about that in a moment, but in terms of food insecurity, the lack of indoor dining means that there is now a lot less food in the trash, which means that rodents um, now have the main source of a food supply cut off. Now, the rats and mice have to go somewhere else for food. In other words, whereas pre-pandemic, they mostly live off food waste you know, in the commercial uh, areas, now they have to go to the more residential areas for food. In fact, back in May, the CDC issued a, 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 uh, CDC issue a warning saying that the pandemic is causing rodent infestation uh, in residential areas. And not just that, these uh, hangry rodents are getting more aggressive. And I suppose that's understandable, right? The hungrier you know, they get, the more aggressive they need to be in order to secure food. And, um, and so uh, this, this last point I thought is actually very on brand for 2020. Uh, rodents are starving so much that some of them are cannibalizing uh, others. And uh, so I think that uh, uh, 
the thing to keep in mind is that uh, when uh, when it comes to um, food insecurity, it affects not just uh, you know humans but also straight animals and you know even with uh, rodents as well. Okay, so uh, the second uh, uh, food justice concern that I want to talk about is equitable distribution uh, of resources and specifically what the uh, what the panic shopping you know uh, tell, tells us right uh, the, uh, with stocking up foods and hoarding. Um, and as you can see, uh, this is uh, my cat Linguini inspecting her, her stash of treats uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and as I said earlier, um, the moment I felt the gravity of the pandemic was seeing all the empty shelves in the supermarket. Before that, I was aware of the problem. Uh, my parents live in New York and they experienced the 2003 SARS outbreak. And, um, and so, uh, uh, so I followed the news pretty diligently. But even then, my worry was still very much on an intellectual uh, level. Um, yes, I got some hand sanitizers and instant noodles uh, because my mom told me to, but I, really, I didn't really feel, feel that urgency. It wasn't until I see people panic shopping for pasta, canned food, and, and toilet papers in the supermarket that I register uh, the anxiety of the pandemic. So now I want to look at this question. Um, what do these empty shelves on the supermarket in the supermarket actually tell us? Okay, what, what does it actually say? Um, I spoke with a friend a few weeks into the lockdown and I asked her if she managed to, to get supplies at the stores before they run out. And she and her response was really surprising to me. She said, Well, no, the bodegas here are still very well stocked. I have no problem getting my supply. Now, my friend lived in a, uh, a less affluent neighborhood in the city where people typically shop at bodegas rather than, you know, the, the fancy supermarket with organic foods. And bodega, um, you know, in, in New York are typically, you know, small convenience stores. They are usually owned by, uh, operated by the owner, and they are not part of, you know, a national chain um, uh, supermarket. Right. In any case, uh, I was surprised by my friend's uh, comment, and I was like, "Wait, what are you saying? Right? Are you telling me that people in your area don't panic shop? You know, uh, 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 you know, don't don't stock up or anything?" And my friend was like, "Well, they can't afford to, even if they wanted to. Uh, they live paycheck to paycheck, so uh, they just don't have the extra money to buy fifty cans of beans." And I thought. Um, you know, what I thought was significant about this shopping frenzy is once again the structural economic inequality that it, that it exposes. You need disposable income in order to buy in bulk. So the very possibility of holding foods and other essential is for the most part uh, reserved for individuals who have the extra money to spend. In other words, uh, in a somewhat counterintuitive way, the empty shelves, the empty shelves um, in the in the well-to-do neighborhoods are actually indicative of excess and not a lack. So, whereas, whereas on the other hand, when you see the well-stocked, you know, shelves in lower-income neighborhoods, they are actually more indicative of poverty or the hardship of the neighborhood. So one of the points about stocking up or hoarding in the more affluent neighborhood is that a lot of times these hoarders or panic shoppers, they are not even do doing the shopping themselves. They outsource the risk of infection by paying someone else to go to a crowded uh, supermarket to do the shopping. They use platforms like Amazon or Instacart uh, you know, to hire shoppers. When I was uh, at the store back in March, I would say that 50% of people uh, shopping there were actually shopping for someone else. And you can tell because uh, they, are, they all shop with the same paper bag with an Amazon logo. So the empty shelves in these fancy supermarkets are actually um, more indicative of the economic and class privilege than the actual shortage of food supply. In fact, when I what I learned later is that Supermarkets like Whole Foods um, are not out of food. Uh, they have plenty of canned beans in the back room. They just didn't have enough people to restock the shelves. They just couldn't restock the shelves fast enough uh, because as soon as they put something on the shelf, 
someone would come and clean it out. In fact, at one point in March, uh, the store that I go to had to significantly reduce their hours in order to give uh, their employee time to restock. So once again, I think what uh, this somewhat counterintuitive picture invites us to ask a different set of questions. So instead of asking, are we going to run out of food? Maybe the more pressing question is, are we having an equitable food distribution? Okay, so pandemic or not, we have to eat. If we go to the grocery store, we are increasing traffic and exposure. If we hire uh, someone to shop for us, we are outsourcing the, the, the risk. We are essentially paying someone else to shoulder the burden for us. So it seems that we are caught in this impossible ethical dilemma. This brings us uh, to the next section. So um, in this section on food justice, I want to focus on our ethical responsibility to those who provide us food. What exactly uh, you know, do we owe to those um, uh, who, who feed us? And once again, I think some of what I'm about to say here might be more geographically and culturally specific. It has a lot to do with the uh, culture of restaurant dining in New York City. At the beginning of the lockdowns, uh, restaurants were only doing takeout and delivery. At the time, the takeout versus delivery debate is very similar to the grocery shopping uh, debate, right? We have a very similar dilemma. If we pick up food um, you know, from the restaurants ourselves, then we are increasing traffic and exposure, right? But uh, if we uh, rely on delivery people, then once again, we are outsourcing uh, health risk. So at least at the early stage, people were concerned with the sort of responsibility that we owe to those who deliver food to us. But I think most people believe that it is still an acceptable practice from the public health perspective. The less people are out and about, the more likely we can curb the spread of the virus. Another reason in favor of outsourcing risk is that it provides employment opportunities. Even though you know, they obviously don't want to get sick, the delivery people also need to make a living. And if no, one order, uh, if no one orders delivery, then they would lose income. So that doesn't seem helpful. So some people, at least you know, according to some people, right, it seems that the more um, reasonable thing to do is just to be more conscientious. Uh, wear your mask when you receive your delivery, uh, leave a substantial tip to compensate for the service. It doesn't really take away the unsavoriness of uh, outsourcing health risk, but that seems to be the least wrong thing to do. So, um, so a few months into the lockdown, uh, New Yorkers uh, were pretty sick of uh, um, uh, staying home. There's a tremendous uh, pressure to for the city to reopen restaurants for dining in, uh, for dining in. Around that time, the positivity rates in New York uh, was pretty low, about 1%, and people were really sick of being stuck at home. Many of them were uh, you know, really sick of cooking for themselves as well. So now the debate becomes, um, is it responsible to start dining out again? Now, the main reason in favor of using delivery service can be applied here, which is, well, we want to support local businesses and so dining at the restaurant is one way to do it. Also, even though uh, uh, deli doing delivery would allow delivery people to keep working, we also have to consider the wait staff. The wait staff, like the delivery people, would also like to make a living. Now, the downsides, uh, there are of course downsides. One of them is that, for one thing, indoor dining is partly responsible for the surge of virus cases in other parts of the country. And that shouldn't be surprising. Uh, we can't wear a mask when we eat and eating and talking in proximity with others increase uh, uh, you know, the risk of transmission. And waste staff are particularly vulnerable because uh, even though they are required to wear a mask uh, when they serve, the diners are not required to wear a mask. And unlike a delivery person, the waste staff has to interact with the diners. So they are certainly more at risk at getting sick. <clears throat> 
So once again, uh, you know, this highlights the plight of many frontline essential workers. They have to choose between health and income, between lives and livelihood. So one solution is outdoor dining. Uh, you can see in this picture here, restaurants have set up, you know, little bubbles to, uh, to set the diners apart. By early June, restaurants in New York City were finally permitted to do uh, outdoor dining. Indoor dining was still, you know, banned at the time, but restaurants can at least put some, you know, tables outside and serve. The rationale is that with outdoor dining, waste staff and diners are less likely to, to get infected because it is easier for the aerosol to disperse. But this obviously cannot be a long-term solution. And there are several problems. Uh, the first is that um, outdoor dining is very weather dependent. No one wants to eat in the rain and New York winter can be pretty cold. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people would enjoy eating out when it is zero degree out. Second, not all restaurants can benefit from it. For example, many small immigrants own uh, restaurants, especially in my neighborhood uh, in Chinatown and Little Italy. Um, they cannot afford to buy, you know, additional tables and chairs that are outdoor appropriate. And building these plastic bubbles and buying heat them for the winter can be very costly. They are already struggling because of the loss of revenue, and many of them just cannot afford to set up the outdoor dining uh, for business. So it seems that uh, even the solution itself, uh, uh, this, even the solution seems to privilege the fancy expensive restaurants and not the kind of restaurants that are more likely to be owned and frequent by the lower income population. So it seems that even the solution is fraught with ethical issues. So um, one other thing that is worth, uh, you know, uh, considering is how the um, uh, is how the uh, uh, pandemic affects the meat the meat industry. As you may know, there have been major outbreaks in uh, meat processing uh, facilities. Um, uh, in April and May, more than seventeen thousand workers were infected and almost 10, 100 of them died just in those two months. Workers in the slaughterhouses and, uh, and the meat processing facilities are particularly vulnerable because they often work in proximity, close proximity, and they work for long hours. It is also worth uh, mentioning that, uh, pointing out that the majority of these workers are racial and ethnic minorities, many of whom are undocumented workers who don't have a proper work uh, permit. And, and this has several implications. The first is that many of these workers, uh, many, of, many of these workers may be less inclined to disclose symptoms when they get sick because they don't want to get penalized uh, or lose their employment. The second is that uh, the immigrant workers are typically housed in uh, overcrowded you know, dormitory. And many of them don't have a vehicle or driver license, and they rely on overcrowded buses to ferry them back and forth to work. Third is that many of them have no health insurance or easy access to medical facilities, which means they may not receive medical attention until, get, until, get, until they get really sick, if they receive any attention at all. At this point, it should become clear that when we talked about responsibility, or what we owe to essential workers during the pandemic, we can't just fixate on our individual responsibilities. The debates cannot be confined to, should I eat out or order delivery? Should I hire someone else to do my grocery shopping? Of course, these questions are important. Each of our action you know, can directly affect the well-being of others. If I order my food at a restaurant without wearing a mask, I am putting the, the, the waste up at risk. Right? But these questions on individual responsibility should not obscure the larger discussion on our collective responsibility or institutional responsibility. And what these outbreaks show us is that a responsible um, health policy may involve a reconsideration of our immigration policy and labor laws as well. Now, at this point, I have talked about um, uh, various groups of individuals who feed us. Mm -hmm people who deliver groceries and take out for us, uh, the waste staff at restaurants, 
and workers at the meat processing factories. The last group of um, uh, stakeholders that I want to talk about is animals that are being used as food. So they are feeding us in a literal, sacrificial, and non-consensual manner. As with the pandemic, a lot of food um, has gone to waste simply because of the disruption of the supply chain. When there is an out outbreak in the food, uh, when there's an outbreak in a meat packing facility or a slaughterhouse, they have to close down the facility for deep cleaning. So what this means is that farmers who raise animals for the slaughterhouse have nowhere to send the animals and the farm animals keep reproducing, right? So many of them, many of these farms run out of space to house these animals or the money to feed them, which means that uh, uh, a lot of them ended up having to euthanize, you know, uh, 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 the, these, uh, you know, animals uh, that were raised for food. In May 2020, the Minnesota Pork Producer, Producers Association estimated that they have to destroy 300,000 pigs just in the state of Minnesota alone. And this is uh, happening all over the country. So uh, this brings me to the next to the, you know, question, right? What do we owe to these animals? And I think there's, there is something especially strange and unsettling about this last group of stakeholders. When we talked about what we owe to people who feed us, such as uh, waste staff at restaurants, delivery people, or workers at the meat uh, packing industries, we can think of ways to mitigate the adverse effects caused by the pandemic. But what do we owe to animals that are raised, in, uh, that are raised to be slaughtered and eaten? As someone who doesn't really think that we should raise animals for food, I am not entirely sure what to make of this. I'm hesitate to go call this a waste in part because I don't, I don't know, I don't want to legitimize the idea of uh, factory farming, uh, especially the way, you know, uh, that is typical in the United States. And from the perspective of, uh, of, cow, of the cows and pigs, it doesn't really matter whether they end up being eaten or being useful. They won't suffer less simply because, simply with the knowledge that they will end up, um, you know, getting eaten. And depending on how they euthanize, euthanize the animals in the farm, these animals may end up suffering less uh, than being killed in the slaughterhouse. But it seems strange to say that we owed it to the animals to consume them so they don't die in vain. Um, although, you know, occasionally, you know, I, I do, I mean, I, I do find myself saying something like that, uh, especially with my cat. Um, she is uh, transitioning to a new diet. And so, you know, I'm, I have to try to get her to try different type, type of foods. And uh, every time, you know, she wastes food, I, I want to say to her, Linguini, you are, you, know, you have to eat this food because, uh, you know, the chicken died in vain for you. But it, it seems strange, uh, you know, to think about it in that, in that way that we owed it to the animals to eat them. Um, so, so I think that, but I don't really have a settled feel on that. And, and I would like to really like to hear what you, what you might, might think about this in the Q&A. Um, so the final section of my presentation is on the, uh, on the question of identity. How does the pandemic change the way we understand who we are and what our community is? is? So um, let me first apologize for this shameless plug for my forthcoming book. Um, before the pandemic, I was uh, procrastinating on a project that has nothing to do with food. At the time, I was writing a book uh, defending slackers, people who are unmotivated, people who just don't care to make themselves useful. And then the pandemic hit, and all of a sudden, I started staying at home a lot more, much to the delights of Linguini. And I ended up writing an ent entire chapter on uh, pandemic slackers. And what I ended up arguing in that chapter is that the kind of existential anxiety induced by the pandemic is bound up with uh, work and being useful. This is why we see countless recommendations on how to remain productive in the lockdown. Recommendations on how you can still make yourself useful even if you lose your job or stuck at home. So how is it related to food, you may wonder. Well. Interestingly, a lot of these activities that are supposed to keep us productive has to do with food or cooking. For example, 
people were baking so much that there was a shortage on flour and yeast uh, at the stores. And uh, sourdough apparently was particularly uh, popular. Um, and uh, enough people started raising, you know, their own chicken in the uh, in the backyard that there was e even, you know, a shortage on, uh, you know, chicks. So making our own sourdough bread and even raising our own chicken becomes a way to keep ourselves busy to 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 maintain, you know, our productivity to make ourselves feel like we are still doing something. Another interesting way. Um, uh, uh, Another interesting way people try to be useful or try to make a difference during the pandemic is uh, also food related, right? For example, when restaurants were forced to close at the beginning of the pandemic of the lockdown, many of them started to cook and deliver food to the hospitals for the, um, for the healthcare professionals, often for free. Some of these restaurants initially were, <clears throat> were just trying to use up their perishable, perishable in the pantry. But many of them see, also see this as a way to do their part, to make a meaningful contribution uh, to the pandemic relief efforts. Similarly, there are numerous uh, grassroots efforts to deliver foods and grocery to the elderly and other vulnerable individuals. Um, feeding others then is a way to stay productive. I'm not suggesting that people uh, help out another just to feel good or just to, you know, uh, you know, feel productive about themselves. But the pandemic has made many of us feel powerless, right? And that uh, we, we don't have control over. So there are many things that, uh, that we cannot do because of the pandemic. So maybe that's why even baking a loaf of, uh, you know, sourdough bread gives us a sense of accomplishment. Even delivering a meal to someone in need may help us regain a sense of control. So I want to end my presentation by pointing out that um, the pandemic affects not just our individual identity as a productive citizen who can make a difference. It affects even the identity of an entire city. For many New Yorkers, restaurants and bars are such an integral part of the city's cultural landscape that the pandemic presents uh, nothing short um, of an identity crisis. So I will show you uh, headlines of three New York Times articles. The first asks, what is New York without New York bars? The second is more specifically about uh, Chinatown in Manhattan, uh, in, my, in my neighborhood. Who are we for? How, how the virus is testing the identity of Chinatown. Right? So uh, the, the article itself uh, is about you know, Chinatown restaurants specifically, um, uh, the, the sort of uh, people that they serve and how they might you know, uh, uh, keep up with you know, time and, uh, and the crisis. And finally, in, these, uh, in this uh, opinion piece, can anyone save New York's bars and restaurants? The author who owns two bars in Brooklyn points out the following. Independent restaurants and bars are a defining element of a city's very identity. So a stake is not just the identity of individual New Yorkers, but the identity of the city as a whole. For many, without restaurants and bars, New York is not even recognizable. So uh, this, is, uh, this is what I have today, uh, and thanks for listening. Thank you, thank you, Alice.